So hello, step-by-step -step scientists. My name is Avery Swarthout. I am a mechanical engineer based in gas turbine development. And today we're going to be talking about the gas turbine thermodynamic cycle and having an introduction to gas turbine technology. So let's get started. And we'll start with a quick introduction to gas turbines and why we use them. Gas turbines are a more than $20 billion per year industry. So you can tell that we use gas turbines in all sorts of different industries and applications and in many different walks of life. And they affect our day-to-day -day activities. So it's really important to understand uh, why they work and why they're useful. So a gas turbine is a machine that is converting a chemical energy, typically some liquid fuel, into kinetic energy by means of a continuously burning system. And this continuously burning system is the key differentiating factor between a gas turbine and a more conventional, say, four-stroke engine. So the four-stroke engine, if you look on the right, you can see that we have one component, our piston and piston chamber, that is responsible for executing all four steps of our thermodynamic cycle, intake, compression, power, and exhaust. And because it has to do all of these things sequentially, our piston is only able to produce one power stroke for every four strokes that the engine actually cycles through. A gas turbine is very different. So in a gas turbine, we have discrete components that handle each part of the thermodynamic cycle, a unique intake system followed by a discrete row of compressors. That is followed by a combustion system, and that goes then to our exhaust system. So we always have air passing through every section of our gas turbine, and that means that the gas turbine is always lit, it's always burning, and this is what a continuously burning system is. We can do a couple different things with the gas turbine exhaust. You see here on the top a nozzle that accelerates our hot exhaust gases and produces a thrust. And on the bottom, you can see that we have an electrical generator connected to our turbine. So our turbine is spinning our electrical generator to produce some sort of electrical energy. So a gas turbine is very, very, um, very dynamic and able to do a lot of different things depending on how you design it. So this continuously burning system means that we are able to produce a lot of power with the gas turbine in a very small size and weight. Another thing is that the gas turbine is very efficient at single operating points or within a narrow operating range. So for a smaller gas turbine, you may expect around a 20% efficiency just from the gas turbine. But as you make larger and larger gas turbines, that efficiency is going to increase up to, with the largest gas turbines today, you can see 40 or even 41 or 42% efficiency with a large power generation gas turbine. What this implies is that the gas turbines are scalable. So it's possible to build very, very small gas turbines, just a, a couple kilowatts. Um, this turbine you see here on the, top, uh, on the top right is just a couple kilowatts and it uh, just fits under my arm. So it's a really small gas turbine intended for RC uh, hobby aircraft. But the gas turbine efficiency increases greatly with size so we can even build gas turbines that are larger than a person. You see me standing in front of a Rolls-Royce business jet engine here. That's around uh, 12 to 15 megawatts. But we can even go up into hundreds of megawatts, 300, 350 megawatt range gas turbines. So there's a huge range of sizes that are possible with gas turbine design. And that's something that you don't really have with other uh, engine systems. Gas turbines are also very low maintenance because they have a small number of moving parts. Um, the main moving part is this uh, shaft assembly that's made up of the shaft and uh, compressors and turbines. And although it's multiple parts, it moves as one fairly rigid body. Whereas on our internal combustion engine, we have a lot of different kinds of motion that are occurring in a lot of different sliding. So we have the piston head against the piston chamber and the connecting rod um, supported on these two pins of the head and the crankshaft and a lot of different other parts that are moving, and this all creates a lot of wear and tear on the system, and that creates degradation. So our gas turbine, because it only has one moving part, one main moving part, and uh, just a couple bearings supporting that, it's actually a lot less maintenance intensive than a, than a comparable uh, four-stroke engine. The gas turbine can also use a wide range of fuels. So it's possible to use diesel, liquefied natural gas, kerosene fuel like Jet A1 or JP4. Uh, it's also possible to use hydrogen fuel, and this is becoming of uh, greater and greater interest now that we investigate alternative fuels, and gas turbines are very tolerant of using different kinds of fuels, so this makes them an attractive option. 
The gas turbine is also straightforward to install because it has a relatively small number of moving parts. You don't have complex belts or camshafts or anything. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do. And again, because of this one moving part, we have a very, very low vibration system. You can take this shaft and compressors and balance them to a very, very fine degree. But if you have an internal combustion engine with the piston head and connecting rod and crankshaft all moving in different directions at different rates, this is very, very difficult to balance. It's difficult to design around. It's difficult to dampen these vibrations. So the gas turbine presents a lot of advantages for its uh, relative uh, simplicity of motion. And the last thing is that our continuously burning system on a gas turbine is capable of producing very, very low emissions. Because a gas turbine has a continuously burning system, all of the flow phenomena in the combustor are stable. And because they're stabilized and they're occurring continuously, we can be very, very careful with how we control them and modify them to produce the lowest possible emissions. On an internal combustion engine, our power stroke has to occur in a very, very small amount of time. It has to be very rapid, and this makes it difficult to achieve complete combustion, even with very, very advanced injection systems on an internal combustion four-stroke engine. It's uh, pretty much impossible to achieve a complete combustion, so we end up with a lot of nasty emission products from our car engines and four-stroke engines, such as sulfur oxides, carbon monoxide, and soot, and a gas turbine simply avoids these by having a a continuously burning, uh, very efficient combustion system. So there are a couple different types of aeronautical gas turbines that are being employed. And the one that most people are familiar with is the turbofan. And the turbofan has uh, some turbines in the back that are extracting shaft power to drive this large fan up front. And this large fan is capable of producing the majority of the thrust um, for the engine. It produces typically around two thirds of the thrust and using a big fan that moves a lot of air very slowly is uh, a very efficient way to produce thrust. So you're getting around two thirds of the thrust up front here, and the other one third is coming from a hot exhaust uh, jet that comes out the back. But one of the simplest installations, and one that's favored by the military for its simplicity and high power, is the turbojet. And the turbojet, it doesn't have any fan, so we're just using these hot exhaust gases as a, as a means of thrust by accelerating them through this nozzle. But what this means is that we produce a very, very fast jet, so that's capable of, produ of propelling an aircraft to very, very high speeds. And uh, we can also add things like an afterburner, something that's shown here, to further mix more fuel into our system and produce more thrust for, for even higher speeds. And uh, again, this is a very simple system simplest kind of gas turbine in an aeronautical application that there is, so it's very reliable, and this makes it favored by the military. But we don't have to actually, uh, for an aeronautical gas turbine, we don't have to accelerate this hot exhaust jet to produce some amount of thrust. We can also take all of the exhaust gases and just extract as much work out of them as possible with a turbine and use that turbine connected to a shaft to drive, let's say, a propeller. So one installation of the turboprop is that you extract all the energy from your hot exhaust gases and have a long shaft here that's uh, connected to a gearbox typically and then driving a propeller. And we can even have something called a turbo shaft where we don't just drive a propeller, but we actually drive a helicopter main rotor. So that requires that we install the gas turbine horizontally and then change the direction that the power is going by 90 degrees so that we can drive the vertical shaft of the helicopter main, main rotor. And you'll see a picture of that later. So these are the three or four most common types of aeronautical gas turbines. Industrial gas turbines, because they sit on the ground and they're stationary, we can typically make them more complex. We can add more complexity to increase the performance. So you typically see many stages of different compressors and many stages of different turbines, but we still have the same four steps, intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. And again, we don't produce any hot exhaust jet as a thrust, but we extract shaft horsepower using a turbine. And then we can connect the shaft to an electrical generator or a pump or some other mechanical process. So those are the main configurations of gas turbines, and we're going to see how they're applied now. And the most common application that people usually think of with the gas turbine is commercial and private aviation. You can see here, uh, a uh, Boeing 747 that's powered by four turbofan engines. But on smaller aircraft, you'll typically see turboprops 
So here's a commercial Bombardier Q400. If you fly regional, you've probably flown on one of these before. It has uh, two large engines and uh, connected to a propeller, but that's actually a gas turbine in there driving that propeller. Then, of course, we have a helicopter engine that we talked about. So you can see here on the top a gas turbine, and that's connected through a mechanical drive um, to spin the helicopter main rotor that would be coming out here. This is from a, a factory that I visited. The helicopter is not uh, fully assembled. And then one application that a lot of people don't think about is the auxiliary power unit. And the auxiliary power unit is a small gas turbine, just a few hundred kilowatts typically, that we put in the tail of our aircraft. And uh, many, many aircraft have these. And the reason that we have the auxiliary power unit is that it can be used to start the main engines. And it can also be used as a source of emergency power so we can connect it to an electrical generator. And if the aircraft loses power, mid-flight, then we can use the auxiliary power unit as an emergency source of backup power to power our flight controls and critical aircraft systems so that the aircraft is safely returned to the ground. So auxiliary power units, they're used all over the place. If you've flown on an aircraft before, you definitely flew on an aircraft with an auxiliary power unit, but people don't often think of that as one application of a gas turbine. Then we also uh, talked briefly about the military air aircraft engines, and they're always, almost always, I should say, using turbofans. Um, for their fighters. You see here an F-15 uh, Eagle that's powered by two turbo turbojet engines here. Then we have some other more exotic applications. Here is a RC, RC jet aircraft that's powered by turbojets. I took this photo at a, at a festival for these jets in Germany. Um, we can also have a turbojet installed on, let's say, a glider as a means of extending the range so that you don't land your glider in an expensive, uh, your expensive glider in a field if the conditions turn poor. So there are some other uh, more exotic aeronautical applications of the gas turbine. And there are also many industrial applications. So we have marine engines. Um, again, the gas turbine is very small, but capable of producing a huge amount of power. And it can be very efficient at one uh, operating point. So a marine engine that, that cruises across the ocean at a fairly constant uh, speed, this is a, a great application for a gas turbine. And we have also large scale power production. That's one of the largest industries for gas turbines. And that's also the largest gas turbines that you are seeing um, designed today in a 300 to 350 megawatt range are producing large scale power for our grid. But also if you have a remote site, let's say an oil rig like this or a remote scientific research center, and you don't necessarily have access to the grid energy, one solution to that is to install a small gas turbine, a micro turbine, that can just sit there right on site and produce that energy for you. So oil rigs, remote uh, scientific research centers as well, these are all using uh, uh, gas turbines as a means of producing reliable power right there on site so that you do not have to be dependent on the grid energy. Our oil and gas industry as well love to use gas turbines for pumping liquefied natural gas or crude oil along their large pipelines. So you typically see 10 to 50,000 horsepower gas turbines not being used to produce electrical energy, but actually being used to drive a pump to pump our, our, um, our natural resources along a pipeline. And then we even have some more uh, exotic applications. You see here uh, the M1 Abrams tank that's powered by a gas turbine. And in the 60s and 70s, it was common to experiment with gas turbines for cars and for trains. So here's the Chrysler turbine car. And here's a French uh, high-speed train from back in the day. And although these applications have kind of lost some, some popularity, there's actually been a lot of development in new materials for gas turbines, new technologies for increasing the efficiency of gas turbines beyond the, let's say, 20 to 40% normal range. So we're now seeing renewed interest in using gas turbines in some of these uh, land-based vehicles. So that was a quick introduction to the gas turbine technology and why we care about gas turbines and why they're important. The next video will be going through an example of the gas turbine thermodynamic cycle, showing you how to calculate all the important properties. So thank you very much, and I'll see you then.